A psychological exhumation changed the outcome of the investigation four years later. A psychological profile is called a detailed examination and analysis of a person's personality, their character traits, behavioral peculiarities, emotional state, intellect, self-esteem, and the motivations behind their actions. To compile such a profile, experts typically resort to methods such as interviews, various psychological tests, observations, situational modeling, and even analysis of social media pages. But what if the person has long passed away and you need to create their psychological profile and assess their emotional state shortly before death? The case of Kristen Trickle is quite complex and, one might say, unique in its kind. It is referred to as the first instance of psychological exhumation in forensic history, conducted to uncover the motivations and thought processes of a young woman who suddenly decided to settle accounts with life. No one believed that the joyful, devout Kristen, who had big plans for the future, would suddenly end everything without any apparent reason. The forensic pathologist's conclusion supported the main theory, but an experienced psychologist managed to uncover the truth. The main problem was the time that had passed since the tragedy. Years had gone by, but eventually, this did not prevent the conviction of the criminal, who was sure he had gotten away with it. The Love Story of Kristen and Colby Trickle Kristen Trickle, née Reese, was born on August 14, 1993, in a small town in southeastern Nebraska. Her childhood can hardly be described as carefree and untroubled. Her biological mother left the family when the little girl was not even three years old. The woman abandoned her husband and child for another man, moved to California, and never again showed interest in her daughter's fate. Kristen's father, James, raised his daughter on his own, doing everything possible to ensure she lacked for nothing. However, the man suffered from a severe illness that progressively worsened, and when Kristen turned 16, her father passed away. Since there were no other close relatives, she could have been sent to a shelter until she came of age. At this time, an aunt and uncle on her father's side, who lived in the neighboring state of Kansas, stepped in. Although the couple was raising three children of their own, they expressed a willingness to take in their orphaned niece and do everything possible to ensure her comfortable and happy life. Soon, the young girl moved into her relative's home. In her new family, Kristen never felt like an outsider. On the contrary, her aunt and uncle treated her just as they did their own children, surrounding her with love and care. Kristen herself did well in school, attended art studio classes, helped her family with household tasks, and dreamed of becoming a veterinary doctor because she loved animals dearly. Relatives and friends described her as responsive, kind, friendly, and very sweet. She never despaired, confidently pursued her goals, and energized everyone around her with her optimism. The Rice family was religious, so they regularly attended church on Sundays, where 18-year-old Kristen met a young man named Colby. He was an aspiring musician, performing as part of a band that played music during sermons and services. He had also recently turned 18, was quite talented, and dreamed of building a successful music career in the future. The young people quickly formed a friendship, which soon turned into a romantic relationship. Colby was skilled on the guitar and wrote his own songs, which he dedicated to his beloved, capturing her heart. He was open, sociable, cheerful, easily made friends, and could easily be the life of any party. After finishing high school, the young man took a serious interest in military affairs and joined the army. By the age of 18, he had signed several contracts and commenced his service in the U.S. Armed Forces. Over the next three years, he managed to build a decent military career. Meanwhile, he stayed in touch with Kristen, with whom he frequently called and corresponded. At the age of 21, Colby unexpectedly entered the reserves, returned home, and proposed to his sweetheart, who happily accepted. The couple married in April 2014. The newlyweds settled in a small town called Hayes, in Kansas, where Colby finished college and pursued a music career, albeit not very successfully. He performed at small parties and local events, playing cover versions of well-known hits. The couple had two dogs, 
which they adored, and many considered their marriage quite happy. However, five years into their marriage, a terrible tragedy occurred. A grim Halloween Eve. On October 31, 2019, around 4 in the morning, a distressed call was made to the emergency services dispatch. The caller, a man who identified himself as Colby Trickle, reported that his wife, Kristen, had fired a bullet into her head from a revolver kept in their home. A medical team was promptly dispatched to the scene, along with a police patrol car that was nearby at the time. At the front door, they were met by a young man who allowed the officers inside but stayed outside himself. Trickle appeared relatively calm, given the severity of the situation. When the officers entered the bedroom, they found a woman lying on the bed in a pool of her own blood. A large revolver lay on her abdomen, and a gunshot wound was evident on her chin. It seemed she had already passed away, but unexpectedly, the victim moved her hand and an officer found a weak pulse and breathing. Following this, Kristen was moved to the adjacent room to properly position her on the floor for resuscitation efforts. Unfortunately, despite all efforts, she had passed away by the time the ambulance arrived, and the medical team could only confirm her death. Sergeant Brandon Hotman went outside and informed Colby that his spouse had passed away. The young man asked repeatedly if the officer was sure about this, and upon receiving confirmation, he began to cry. His behavior and tears seemed insincere, as just minutes before Hotman's arrival, he had been casually talking with other patrollers about video games. At first glance, it appeared that the woman had indeed decided to end her life voluntarily, but upon examining the scene, experienced detectives immediately suspected foul play. It was Halloween Eve, and it seemed the deceased had been actively preparing for the celebration. On her bedroom's vanity lay handmade costume decorations she had prepared, and in the kitchen, themed treats for children were set out in bowls, including lollipop bats and ghosts, gummy worms and more, an uncharacteristic way out. The chosen method of ending her life was very strange and untypical for a woman, as was the scene itself. First, the deceased was found nearly undressed, wearing only her underwear. Women generally want to look beautiful even in death, concerned about how they will be found. Secondly, a gunshot to the head is not a typically feminine method again, due to concerns about disfiguring themselves. Kristen's face was so badly damaged that she had to be buried in a closed casket. The third and most significant oddity was the weapon itself. The revolver was too large and cumbersome for such a petite and fragile woman. It would have been uncomfortable for her to hold, and she could hardly have twisted her arm to shoot herself in the chin. Moreover, the position of the weapon puzzled the officer as it lay on the woman's stomach, pointing sideways. However, the deceased spouse explained that after realizing what had happened, he too had thought about ending his life, had held the revolver to his temple but then abandoned the thought and decided to call emergency services in hopes of saving his beloved. While law enforcement continued their work at the scene, the woman's mobile phone lying on a nightstand unexpectedly rang with an alarm. It turned out the deceased had plans for the morning and had set the alarm not to be late, but she seemingly changed her mind during the night and decided to end her life. This looked highly suspicious and detectives suspected they were dealing with a masterful staging. The widower, now the main suspect, was due for questioning, interrogation, and Colby's account. The man willingly agreed to go to the police station to give his statement. He appeared upset, but not devastated, behaving calmly and confidently. He explained that on that evening, his wife, Kristen, returned from her job at Walmart, where she was a manager expecting a promotion to senior manager. They had dinner together, played video games, and then Colby went to bed early because he was feeling unwell, while Kristen went to the kitchen to finish cleaning and setting out sweets for the holiday. In the middle of the night, Colby was awakened by a sudden, loud bang. For a few seconds, he was disoriented, his ears ringing, and he could see nothing in the darkness. Once he turned on the light, he found his wife lying motionless beside him, blood pouring from her head. He tried to revive her, but realizing it was futile, he grabbed the revolver, held it to his own head,
but then set it back on her body, called emergency services, and went outside to meet the police. The sequence and nature of his actions raised many questions. For instance, why he placed the weapon on the woman's abdomen instead of throwing it on the floor, the bed, or leaving it on a nightstand. It was also unclear why he waited outside for the police and medics if he thought his wife might still be saved. Typically, in such situations, people attempt to perform life-saving measures or simply press something against the wound to stop the bleeding. The former serviceman did not approach his wife again, explaining that he was in shock. While a police officer was trying to provide first aid before the medics arrived, Colby did not come over or inquire about the situation. Instead, he casually talked outside with a patrol officer about music and video games. Upon learning that Kristen was no longer alive, he squeezed out a few tears but quickly regained his composure. At the station, Colby was asked the standard question about whether there was any life insurance on the deceased, to which he responded negatively but added that he was entitled to some minor payouts from the armed forces where he had served. Incidentally, Trickle began boasting about his accomplishments, noting that he had served in intelligence and was involved in special operations around the world. His words sounded convincing, though it soon turned out that almost none of what he said was true. When asked why, in his opinion, his wife might have taken such a desperate step, he replied that she had suffered from prolonged depressions from an early age, which developed against the backdrop of all the events that happened to her in childhood and adolescence. He mentioned her mother's betrayal, her father's death, and her forced life in her uncle and aunt's home, whom Kristen did not even know before. The widower's words again sounded convincing, and he spoke confidently and calmly. Nonetheless, Experienced investigators felt that this man was lying and possibly had premeditated what to say. However, at that moment, they had nothing to charge him with, as there were no concrete pieces of evidence against him, so Mr. Trickle had to be released. Kristen's Family's Perspective When Kristen's uncle, aunt, and her siblings were informed of the tragedy, they immediately traveled to Hayes, nearly 500 miles from their city, to speak with the police and prepare for the funeral. Unanimously, they vehemently denied the possibility that she could have willingly ended her life, citing her deep religious faith, regular church attendance, and her belief that such an act was a sin. Additionally, according to her family, Kristen was a life-loving optimist with ambitious future plans. Specifically, she wanted to open a shelter for homeless animals and had even scoped out an available property with a large plot of land she intended to lease long-term for this purpose. These statements were soon verified, and detectives confirmed that she had been negotiating to rent the property. Moreover, she was anticipating a promotion at work, a position she was very proud of, was preparing her costume and candies for Halloween, and had promised to visit her sister for her birthday in mid-November. Her relatives also insisted that she had never suffered from depression, had no mental disorders or harmful habits. Another crucial point, they stressed, was that she would never recklessly abandon her beloved dogs. During discussions with the police, the uncle and aunt suggested that Colby might have coldly dealt with his wife, orchestrating it to appear as though she had voluntarily left this world. They described her husband as a cruel and domineering man who tried to control every aspect of her interactions, chose whom she could communicate with and would fly into a rage if Kristen did not respond to his calls or messages immediately. He also forbade her from talking to her relatives, and she would call them secretly from her husband. Visits were rare. During her last visit, she confided that she could no longer tolerate such treatment, had talked with her husband about it, and if things did not change, they would have to separate. Autopsy Results and Forensic Expert Conclusions Following conversations with both the widower and the deceased's relatives, detectives believed that the forensic examination would be decisive in the case. The examination revealed only one entry wound from a bullet, located on the chin. The shot had been fired while the woman was lying on her back, with the gun barrel pressed closely to her head. It was possible that she could have inflicted the wound herself, 
although it would have been extremely awkward for her to do so. There were no signs of struggle or resistance on Kristen's body. However, upon learning from relatives that Colby was a true tyrant with controlling behavior, the detectives insisted on an additional examination for any signs of bruises, abrasions, scratches, or other injuries in various stages of healing. They hypothesized that if the former serviceman had occasionally been violent towards his wife, there would inevitably be some traces. Yet the investigation was met with disappointment as no internal or external injuries were found other than the gunshot wound. Pathological liar and a flawed family. The investigation continued to scrutinize Colby, examining his personality, and it was revealed that he was a pathological liar. He lied so frequently and convincingly that it seemed he began to believe his own fabrications. It started with the fact that he had never been in any hot spots, nor had any involvement with intelligence, despite having convinced everyone during the interrogation that he was telling the truth. The man lied to those around him about having a successful music career and high earnings. In reality, for the past several years, Kristen, who worked tirelessly, had been the main breadwinner for their family. Colby, on the other hand, scraped by with occasional gigs during holidays, spending the rest of his time playing video games. Despite his real talent, he lacked persistence, patience, and was hindered by his laziness. Furthermore, the police had a warrant to seize and examine gadgets owned by the couple, and this inspection yielded quite intriguing results. The deceased's phone calendar was packed with scheduled activities ranging from haircuts to meetings with a real estate agent. Meanwhile, Colby's messages revealed that he had been openly flirting with another woman, even exchanging messages while at the police station. On a laptop in the living room, a search history that had been deleted was recovered, showing that shortly before the tragedy, there were queries about the payout amount for a life insurance policy in the event of death. This last aspect particularly interested the authorities. Checks revealed that Colby had lied again. Two insurance policies had been taken out on his wife, with him as the beneficiary in the event of her death. These included military spouse insurance, as well as a standard life insurance policy. The amounts involved were far from trivial contrary to what the man had claimed. He had even calculated exactly what payouts he would be entitled to, the fortunate widower. Despite numerous inconsistencies in the case, direct allegations from the deceased's relatives against Colby and the existence of a clear motive for him, the decision ultimately hinged on the forensic expert's report. The document stated that there were no signs of violence on the body except for a single gunshot wound, suggesting that it was highly likely that the deceased had voluntarily ended her life. The case was closed and archived. By that time, the widower had already received the payouts due to him. From a special insurance for U.S. Armed Forces spouses, he received nearly $50,000, and from the life insurance policy, over $100,000. On the very day the money was deposited into his account, he ordered a life-sized realistic doll for intimate pleasures from an online store. He also purchased a new gaming console, an electric guitar, and expensive musical equipment, and began spending the rest on clothes and entertainment nearly every evening in bars and restaurants. Colby was enjoying life, sparing no expense for himself, and genuinely believed that the story was over, with no evidence against him and thus no potential charges, he lived happily for about two years until a pivotal event occurred, a new prosecutor and the suspect's arrest. In the summer of 2021, a new district prosecutor was appointed to whom the detectives handling the Trickle case appealed for help. They requested permission to reopen the investigation, asserting they had little doubt that the widower had eliminated his wife, making it appear as though she had voluntarily departed from life. As proof, they presented all the peculiarities and discrepancies, pointed to the restored browser history, and highlighted the suspect's very unusual behavior and his clear motive. After reviewing the case materials, the prosecutor authorized the reopening of the case, and in July 2021, Trickle was finally taken into custody. He was charged with first-degree premeditated homicide and intentionally misleading the investigation. During his arrest, 
He remained calm and immediately contacted his lawyers, who began working on his defense right away. Colby's defense relied on the forensic pathologist's findings and argued that Kristen had suffered from chronic depression for many years and her tragic departure was only a matter of time. Meanwhile, his lawyers tried to portray their client as a loving and caring husband, a valorous serviceman, and a devout person. Psychological autopsy. The investigation could have hit a dead end as it relied heavily on the same medical conclusion. Thus, the prosecution took an unprecedented step by bringing in experienced specialists to create a psychological profile of the deceased and analyze her emotional state just before the tragedy. This unusual method was termed a psychological autopsy or psychological exhumation. The psychiatrist conducted extensive work, analyzing data from Kristen's mobile phone, her social media posts, her most recent photos, and also by interviewing her relatives, friends, and colleagues. Gathering and analyzing the information took months, but the expert's conclusion was clear. Kristen could not have intended to end her life, given her short-term and long-term plans. Trial and verdict. The legal proceedings in this complex case began only in September 2023, nearly four years after the tragedy. The defendant had a clear motive, behaved suspiciously, and consistently lied during interrogations, but the forensic expert's conclusion initially worked in his favor. However, the prosecution now had another report that could potentially turn the case around. When Colby was questioned about the insurance inquiries on his computer, he claimed they were probably made by his wife wanting to know the payout amount. However, the date and time of the request completely contradicted his words as the girl was confirmed to be at work at that time, verified by surveillance footage from the store. Asked about the life-sized doll for intimate pleasures that he purchased even before his late wife was buried and other expenses, he responded that he couldn't sleep alone and needed someone to hold and that he bought the console, guitar, etc., as a way to distract himself from grief. His mother corroborated his statements, fiercely defending her son throughout the trial. The psychiatrist's conclusion about the victim's emotional state was pivotal. This meticulous work took time, but its results left no doubt that Kristen had not planned to end her life. Additionally, a curious detail emerged from the autopsy report regarding the bullet's trajectory angle. In the courtroom, the jury was shown the weapon used and the angle at which the bullet entered the girl's chin. Kristen was right-handed, but the nature of the wound suggested that either she shot with her left hand or someone positioned to her left had placed the gun to the head of the sleeping girl and fired. On November 20th, 2023, the jury unanimously found Colby guilty on all counts sentencing him to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole no earlier than 50 years. The defendant never admitted his guilt, and all his appeals were rejected. Most curious and strange in this case, however, is that corrections regarding the cause of death were never made to the medical report. Sometimes exes come back, but the scary thing is not their return but the fact that they may come back with weapons in their hands. On January 18th, 2014, a young couple holding hands walked out of church. It was a bright day they had been looking forward to. The many people attending the service were still inside the church. The man and woman hurried to their parked car to grab boxes of toys and gifts for their young daughter, who was waiting for them at the church. But the subdued January silence was struck by loud pops. One a second, a third. The young men fell like dolls whose batteries had died. Scarlet pools of blood filled the asphalt around them. A few minutes later, the emergency services received a call that two people had been killed in a parking lot near the church. People ran out at the noise. General outrage and shock grew in the roll call of the crowd. A little girl who had not received her presence cried from the panic that gripped her. She, like other parishioners, heard the sounds of gunshots, but did not see the full horror of what had happened. Police arrived at the scene and taped off the area and examined the scene of the attack. 
When emergency ambulance doctors arrived, they were left with only two deaths. The victims were young married couple Nathan and Crystal Maddox. We're going to start at the beginning together. We'll take a look at the lives of our heroes and go into detail about the situation they found themselves in, and also be sure to discuss whether such a tragic end could have been avoided. When lies, betrayal, greed, fear, and darkness become an integral part of someone's mindset, it causes them to commit horrible crimes that no one could ever imagine. In fact, an entire family can be drawn into such crimes, causing many worlds to fall apart. Our story features the brutal double murder of Nathan and Crystal Maddox. So now, if you are interested in learning all the minute details of this case, let's get started. The events of this family send us to Texas, the small town of Combsnail in Tyler County. A town so small that with a population of 563 people, people know each other by sight. And some of them have started families and become relatives. Nathan and Kristen's relationship was very fast-paced. Young people lived on neighboring streets, lived together the first love and the first kiss. The girl's parents did not approve of her choice and in every possible way prevented their relationship. Kristen could not cross her beloved parents and refused her love, but fate presented a surprise, and Kristen learned that she was expecting a child. Parents had nothing left but to accept the situation and let the lovers get married, because it is unworthy to look in front of people as a single mother. Nathan and Kristen got married in Texas, and soon after the wedding they got a house and had their first child, a daughter Madison. But family life turned out to be far from the fairy tale story from the movie. Nathan had to work hard to support his family. Having a house and maintaining it doesn't come cheap, so Nathan was forced to take a job away from home. He traveled to Montana. A young husband and father, he tried to visit Kristen and Madison as often as possible. He often sent money home to them, and for the most part, Nathan was pretty sure he had a happy family waiting for him at home. And that seemed to be the case. He loved Kristen, he loved Madison, he thought they had the perfect little family, until one day he came home from Montana. When he walked in the door, he noticed right away that the house was empty. Most of the things inside the house were gone, and there was a note on the kitchen table. In just a few lines, Kristen cruelly informed him that she was leaving Nathan. The reason seemed strange. The woman wrote that she didn't know where her husband was missing, who he was with, or when he would return. She wrote that she was unhappy, but that was a lie, because Kristen knew perfectly well that Nathan was in Montana for work. He called all the time, asking how she and her daughter were doing, what they were doing. He sent them money on a regular basis. The worst part of this episode was that she took Madison with her, and Nathan is now banned from seeing his daughter. Kristen did a very mean thing, she went to the police station and used false information to gain full custody of her daughter, indicating that her father was not providing for or interested in the child. Nathan knew that the ex-wife and daughter had returned to his parents' home. He repeatedly tried to see little Madison, but the Westfall family was adamant. They were jubilant that they had managed to get rid of an unloved son-in-law. Time passed. Nathan returned to his hometown to be closer to his daughter. He did not give up trying to see her, but he knew that it was necessary, with the help of a lawyer, to obtain official custody of his daughter and to achieve legal meetings. During this difficult period, he meets Crystal. They'd known each other since childhood. They went to school together. When they were teenagers, their paths diverged. Crystal went to the big city. She dreamed of graduating from university. But in her last year she got married and instead of a successful career, she got a happy family life, in which four children were born. But unfortunately, after a while, the relationship between the spouses went downhill, and they decided to divorce. In 2011, Crystal and her children returned to her hometown. Two longtime friends met each other at the most necessary moment for each of them. Nathan was enamored with Crystal's children. From the way their mother interacted with the children, from Crystal's inexhaustible energy that lit up everything around her, like a fairy with her optimism. In 2013, Nathan and Crystal were married. Nathan worked at the Lakin Industries warehouse, while Crystal started a small clothing business, 
opened a children's clothing boutique under her own name and handmade jewelry. The family's business was doing very well and it became feasible for them to hire a good lawyer to get a chance to see Nathan's daughter from her first marriage and try to get custody. Madison was thrilled with her daddy's new wife and the siblings she had. The girl was completely happy in her father's home. This made Lita and Paula Westfall, Kristen's parents, completely resentful. They were very afraid of losing their only granddaughter. Back in 2012, Kristen Westfall, with the support of her parents, applied to the court for full custody of her daughter. The custody battle dragged on for a long two years. The Westfall family had hoped to get full custody very quickly. But Crystal's arrival in Nathan's life changed the whole picture of his existence. A full family, a home, and a good job made a strong case in court, and Nathan was granted visitation rights with his daughter. He was very happy and prepared to take his daughter away for the day. In October 2013, the judge allowed Nathan and Crystal to have supervised visits with Madison. On January 18, 2014, Nathan and Crystal arrived at Mount Carmel Church for Sunday service, after which they wanted to go for a walk with six-year-old Madi. They left the church a little earlier than the rest of the congregation to retrieve pre-prepared gifts for Madison from their car. Just a few steps later, three loud pops were heard. Nathan and Crystal were killed by fatal gunshot wounds to the head. The small town was shocked by the gratuitous execution of a young married couple. But as it later turned out, there was a reason after all. But why take two people's lives, so brazenly and so brutally? The police arrived on the scene and meticulously investigated the scene. Nathan and Crystal had been shot in the head with a 30 caliber rifle, which was found at the scene along with 30 caliber shell casings. An autopsy later revealed that Nathan had also been shot in the thigh with a 20 gauge shotgun, leading investigators to assume that there were two shooters, as it is obvious that one person cannot shoot and reload at the same time. Investigators conducted a series of interviews with witnesses to gather information about the Maddox family and build their picture of what happened. They interviewed parishioners, acquaintances, and relatives of the Slane family. But what surprised them most was the reaction of Nathan's ex-wife's family. Kristen and her parents were called to testify at the police station, as were the other witnesses. The further behavior of this family caused great surprise to the investigators. The Westfalls played up the tragedy too much, trying to hide their joy at the deaths that had occurred. Paul Westfall was so shocked that he went into a seizure, so much so that he couldn't believe the news of Nathan's death that he had to call emergency services. A grown man who had spent years trying to rid himself of Nathan's presence in his daughter's life was so upset that he had a seizure. Kristen was the first person interviewed, and her interview was a little creepy. She was the only one of the family to maintain a very calm and natural demeanor despite the fact that she and Nathan had been together for a long time and had a child together. Kristen continued to give some really weird details about him, trying to bring out only the negative aspects of her ex-husband. She reported that she knew who killed him. In Montana, Nathan was listed in dangerous motorcycle gangs. One day, one of the gang members showed up at Nathan's mother's house and threatened to kill him. This story checked out, but it remained an empty threat because of an accidentally broken motorcycle, and the gang itself turned out to be a common exaggeration to confuse the investigation. Also, as an alibi, Kristen said that on the day of the crime, she was at the grocery store with her father Paul, a couple miles from the church, after which they both went home. Surveillance footage at 10.57 a.m. confirmed their presence at the grocery store. Paul Westfall told the exact same story, but Paul was a hunter and had a firearm in his arsenal, so his hands were tested for traces of gunpowder, but the result was negative. But until now, his reaction to the death of Nathan, whom he sincerely hated and never hid it, seemed to the investigators very strange and played. It left a sliver of doubt in his sincerity. Interviews with loved ones, over a short period of time, helped investigators discover that Nathan Maddox was involved in a custody battle over his daughter with his ex-wife Kristen Westfall and her family. After a long and bitter dispute in court, he was close to retaining custody, something that none of the Westfall family members strongly wanted. Such a desperate battle between the parties 
may well have been cause for reprisal, but the police had no concrete evidence to arrest any member of the Westfall family. The family consisted of four people, and two people were the shooters. Investigators had yet to be convinced of their story and figure out which family member pulled the trigger taking the lives of two people, or whether a hired killer did it. The investigators took a different path and decided to act through the main protagonist of the controversy, little Madison Maddox. After all, her safety was at stake. She continued to be with a family that could pose a threat to her. Police officers, along with Child Protective Services, CPS, came to remove the girl from the home, but faced a wave of protest and rage. The behavior of the older Westfall family entailed a search of the home. What the police later found in the house shocked them. A gun was stored on a shelf in an easily accessible place in the room. The culmination of the search was the illegal drugs scattered around the house. It turns out that in 2013, Kristen Westfall was charged and arrested for possession of a controlled substance. The arrests were repeated, which clearly indicated that Kristen couldn't be a good mother to Madison. When Kristen went to jail in early 2013, her parents were granted temporary custody of their daughter and would not allow Nathan to see her while their granddaughter was in their custody. However, despite Child Protective Services prohibitions, Kristen continued to live in the house with her young daughter in the same room and slept in the same bed with her. Even in 2014, with the injunctions in place, Kristen continued to live with the rest of her family and had daily access to her daughter despite being ordered by the court to move. After a search of the Westfall's home, where a used syringe with residue of illegal substances was found on a dresser and a gun on the nightstand next to Kristen's bed, Little Madison was taken into temporary custody and additional evidence found led to the Westfall's arrest. State authorities wanted the girl placed in foster care and said they found supplies for illegal drugs in the Westfall's home, as well as a gun on a nightstand within easy reach of the girl. Child Protective Services was involved in the Madison Maddox custody case. In March 2014, Less than two months after the tragic murder outside the church, authorities made four arrests. Kristen Westfall, 29, her younger brother Cameron, and her parents Paul and Lita Westfall were arrested. There was no direct evidence of their guilt in the Maddox murder. Cross-examinations didn't produce the desired result either. So the police had to go for a little trickery to put the squeeze on the most vulnerable member of the Westfall family. That was 18-year-old Cameron. He was told that if proven guilty, all members of his family would face life imprisonment, and the direct killers would face the death penalty. Cameron was young and kind-hearted, he was very scared, and quickly agreed to cooperate with the investigation, revealing all the details of what happened. The crime against the young couple, Maddox turned out to be carefully pre-planned by the family gang in order to permanently exclude Nathan from the role of father. Shortly after the shooting episode, it was revealed that Nathan and his ex-wife Kristen, with the help of her family, had been secured a nasty custody disagreement over their five-year-old daughter Madison. The long and costly legal battle was to end well for Nathan. The Westfalls were concerned and carefully plotted a scheme to remove him from Madison's life. Nathan wanted to take care of his daughter alone, but the Westfalls were not interested in letting her go even to see her father, let alone give him the girl permanently. The Westfalls were very hurt by the fact that the former son-in-law had settled down in life and was living a good life. Thus, when the judge allowed him multiple visitations, it became obvious that he could win the trial, which led to Kristen coming up with an original idea to get rid of him once and for all. At first, Kristen tried to find someone to kill her ex-husband. When that failed, she and her father decided to do it themselves. On Sunday afternoon, the family often attended church, and the day of January 18th was no exception. Lita Westfall and Little Madison drove to the appointed time for the service. Afterward, she had to hand the girl over to her father. In the meantime, Kristen and Paul went to a distant store and posed as customers to get on CCTV cameras to create a solid alibi but they miscalculated the timing. Each family member had their own responsible role to play. For the entire interval, they communicated by text message, 
updating each other on the Maddox's movements. Letha, who had attended the service, informed Paul as Nathan and Crystal prepared to leave the church. She also called 911 immediately after the murder. Cameron took an active role in concealing the evidence. He discarded the gun used after his sister and father shot the newlyweds in the head near a remote church. He drove to a lake where he discarded the bag of weapons. Cameron soon agreed to cooperate with authorities and revealed that Kristen originally came up with the idea and the family went along. He also pointed out to investigators the location where he had discarded the murder weapons. Divers later retrieved said items, which confirmed Cameron's words. The police detained 29-year-old Kristen, her brother Cameron and her parents, Paul and Letha Westfall, and charged them with organized crime. Thus, Kristen and Paul pulled the trigger, with Cameron and Lita acting as willing accomplices. Given that Lita was at the church at the time of the incident, it was obvious that she was not responsible for the shots that killed Nathan and Crystal Maddox. However, phone records show that she was responsible for informing her daughter and spouse of the couple's whereabouts, and that she informed them as they left the church. While Kristen and Paul were the ones who fired the bullets, Lita and her son Cameron participated in the crime intentionally. The trial was very loud and lengthy. Each member of the Westfall family was tried separately. Paul Westfall continued to act out his seizures, so he was found mentally unfit and remained in a state psychiatric hospital for a while for evaluation. In May 2014, a judge found Paul incompetent, but that verdict was overturned four months later. With Paul and Letha facing the death penalty for the murders of Nathan and Crystal Maddox, they had little choice but to agree to a mutually beneficial plea bargain with the DA's office. To avoid the death penalty, Paul was forced to take a plea bargain with the prosecution. He pleaded guilty to the charges and thus was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Lita also took a plea bargain with the investigation. Instead of going to trial, she pleaded guilty to participating in organized criminal activity. Lita will not be eligible for parole until 2046. She is currently incarcerated at Mountain View Prison in Gatesville, but will be eligible for parole in 2044. At the time of sentencing, Lita Westfall was 54 years old, so she will likely die in prison. Kristen is the third member of the Westfall family to stand trial in this case. Throughout the entire court hearing, Kristen pleaded not guilty. To all the accusations against her, she replied that her whole family was crazy. She was the only one who was sincere about it. When her entire family, Letha, Paul, and Cameron, came to the trial and testified against her, she couldn't say anything to their faces. In August 2016, the final trial and sentencing for Kristen Westfall began. The motive for killing Nathan and Crystal Maddox was custody of Madison Maddox. Kristen adamantly did not want Nathan to see Maddie whenever he wanted. She did not want to give him the privilege because she could not see him happy. She wanted to control her daughter and father's communication herself and through the child. She wanted to control everything he did and everything he felt. The trial took over a week. In the end, with overwhelming evidence against her, it took the jury eight hours to find her guilty of capital murder. In a Brazos County courtroom, attorneys and the judge considered final motions for the woman. Kristen was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole nearly nine months before her father pleaded guilty and received an identical sentence in May 2017. Kristen Westfall is currently incarcerated at the William Hobby Women's Prison in Falls County, Texas. While Paul, Lita, and Kristen Westfall were ultimately charged with two counts of murder, officials only charged the youngest member of the family, Cameron, with two counts of tampering with or fabricating physical evidence. Cameron Westfall pleaded guilty to two counts of third-degree tampering with evidence. The judge deferred sentencing contingent upon Cameron Westfall testifying against his family. He faced up to 10 years in prison on each charge. It was reported that he had nothing to do with the actual shooting and that his mother was also not involved because she was at the church when the crime occurred. However, phone records show that she texted her husband and daughter as the Mavixes were preparing to go home. Currently, Cameron is incarcerated at the Huntsville Correctional Facility in Huntsville, Texas. 
where he is expected to remain until his expected release date in 2025. Cameron was very indifferent to the crime, and he really had nothing to do with the crime, as he claims Paul allegedly just happened to come home, handed Cameron two guns and told him to throw them away. But the investigation didn't rule out that Cameron knew a little more than he was saying. After all, Cameron lived in the house with his family, and he simply couldn't have not heard about Kristen and Paul's plans to kill the Maddox family. And if he was an unspoken witness to the plot, after all, why didn't he go to the police or even try to stop his family? So ended the story of a double murder at the house of Dodd in a close-knit community that shook the entire state of Texas to its core. Recall that on January 18th, 2014, Nathan and Crystal Maddox were shot and killed right outside the gates of Mount Carmel Baptist Church near Colmsnew. After waiting for a legal and supervised visitation with his five-year-old daughter from a previous marriage, it soon became clear that the girl's biological mother, Kristen Westfall, and her entire family, brother Cameron and parents Lloyd Paul and Lita Westfall, were behind the crime. This case was complicated. The community demanded justice. Lloyd Paul, Lita, and Cameron Westfall made a deal with the investigation. After agreeing to testify against his sister, Cameron took a plea bargain. He pleaded guilty to a lesser charge, two counts of tampering with or fabricating physical evidence. In 2016, a judge sentenced Cameron to 10 years in prison, and his mother received a life sentence. The following year, a judge sentenced Lloyd Paul to life in prison. He avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty to first-degree murder. Under the plea agreement, he would not be able to appeal the sentence. The crime family's protagonist, Kristen Westfall, received a life sentence without parole. In a fateful decision by her mother, Madison Maddox lost her father and will likely never see the grandparents who cared for her and perhaps even loved her. Time after the Westfall family was sentenced, the legal battle for custody of Madison Maddox continues. Nathan Maddox's father, Jim, has since filed a petition to become the primary guardian of his granddaughter. A huge number of people die in custody battles every year. Most importantly, the children are not made happier, but orphans with psychological problems. All the people in the town were devout, went to church, and they're also easily killed people. Covering themselves with concern for the girl, the older generation of Westfall fulfilled the wish of their daughter and helped to commit this terrible crime. What were they hoping for? Based on the story, Nathan was not a bad or mean person. He loved his own daughter and strove to be a good father to her. Obviously, in addition to the custody battle, the hatred associated with the fact that the girl's father had created a new family, was able to pick up his mind, and started a new life without crime comes first, and was perfectly happy with the new woman, having something he didn't have in his past relationship with Kristen. That's what was causing all the negativity from the ex-wife, and she was able to turn her entire family against him. If it was just about custody, they wouldn't have killed Nathan's new woman, and that's probably true. After all, the Madison custody dispute started before Nathan and Crystal's relationship. There is certainly only one loser in the history of the Westfall versus Maddox fight. Of course, it's Madison. I'd like to believe that when she grows up, she won't remember the wild selfishness with which adults try to take advantage of her by saying words about love. After all, if the family had loved the child, they would have tried to build a normal relationship for her sake. But they were only acting to please their own egos. The incident that occurred in the summer of 2012 in Millville, Pennsylvania, USA, captured the attention of not only the local community, but also the entire state for a long time. Many probably still recall the tragic demise of 46-year-old Frank Spencer. What is most shocking is not just that a vibrant man died in the prime of his life, but the dreadful and absurd circumstances of his passing. As a result of the events that unfolded in the family of an auto parts dealer, one person lost his life. His ex-wife ended up in prison, and her father is on the run. This story illustrates how, in a blink of an eye, a close person can become the most alien and hostile. Meeting Frank Frank was born on November 10, 1965, to Cyrus and Madeline Spencer in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. From a young age, 
He was fond of active games and sports, which gave him a robust physique and spirit. In high school, he was recognized as an outstanding member of the wrestling team. The young man had a curious mind and dreamed of continuing the family business. Therefore, after graduating from high school in 1984, he enrolled in a local university. He successfully completed his course of study in 1988, and after his father's death, he became the owner of Spencer's Auto Parts and Used Cars, the Beloveds. A significant event occurred in the young man's life in 1997. Fate brought Maria Sanuti and Frank Spencer together. They were immediately drawn to each other. The woman was noted for her fiery temperament and bold character. Her excessive emotionality was captivating. Frank's friend, Paul Siciliano, remembered that his buddy always liked the wild ones. There was something wild about him, too. So when they met, they had fun, he recalled. However, not everyone was pleased with the relationship, especially the lover's parents. Rumor has it that Anthony, Rocco Franklin, Maria's father, was associated with a gang and even had a reputation as a hired criminal. He took an immediate dislike to his daughter's suitor. For some time, he even tried to obstruct their union. The Spencer family was also not thrilled with Frank's choice. For this reason, the couple eloped and rented an apartment away from their families. To maintain contact with the young people, their families were forced to accept their feelings. Family life. Soon, Maria and Frank got married. After some time, they had children, first a boy and then a girl. After that, the family moved into a new home. During this time, Frank owned the auto parts business and sponsored racing cars. He worked hard to provide everything necessary for his family. For the head of the household, his children became a top priority and motivation in life. Initially, Maria tried to manage the children and household chores. However, later, despite her law degree, she began coaching her daughter's soccer team. According to friends, unlike her husband, she was not as warm to the marriage. She seemed all over the place and a bit out of this world. Domestic chores and responsibilities did not interest her. What really worried her was money. She greatly enjoyed spending what Frank earned. But what was more striking was her coldness towards the children. Gradually, Mrs. Spencer's behavior led to problems in the marriage. Her husband became dissatisfied with her selfishness and eccentricity. He felt that, having become a mother, she should have matured and thought of others. However, Maria did not change. In 2006, the man initiated a divorce. He was finally tired of the constant scandals and inappropriate behavior of his wife. Sometimes she behaved so unreasonably that Frank feared for the children's health. At that time, the idea of divorce seemed to be the only correct solution. However, after deciding to separate, the relationship between the former spouses became even more strained. The confrontation. Spencer wanted to keep the children with him. He didn't trust his ex-wife, and was convinced that she couldn't properly care for them. Not everyone in his circle agreed with his stance. For example, his friend Ron asserted that for the children's normal development, both parents were necessary. He strongly recommended that his friend negotiate with Maria and share custody equally. Apparently, Frank knew more than his friends did, so he continued to insist on sole custody. In retaliation, the woman did the same. Moreover, she was counting on substantial child support payments. This conflict intensified over time. More than once, due to his ex-wife's erratic behavior, the man had to call the police. The woman would attack him and the children. However, not everyone believed this. In 2008, an incident occurred that confirmed the main character's words. Following a scuffle with her former mother-in-law, Maria was arrested near her child's school. The issue was that she came to pick up the girl, but Frank's mother tried to stop her. It turned out that the woman's decision was justified since they had another arrangement that day. But at the last minute, Maria decided to change it. After the fight, she took the child and put her in the car but forgot to buckle her up. On the way, Police officers stopped her car and assessed her actions as a threat to the child's life and health. 
Consequently, Maria began having problems. She was charged with disorderly conduct. Additionally, Frank accused his ex-wife of stalking him. He claimed that she had repeatedly followed him. For this reason, she was charged with another crime. However, the prosecution could not prove a threat to the child's life. Therefore, the authorities agreed to drop the charge in exchange for her guilty plea to disorderly conduct and stalking. Ultimately, Maria admitted her guilt and was fined $600. But even this event did not make the woman reconsider her behavior. Quite the opposite occurred. The ex-wife became more embittered. After this case, Frank's acquaintances and relatives increasingly heard complaints from him. He reported that Maria had escalated to threats, and her stalking continued. Later, some of Mrs. Spencer's colleagues confessed that she had repeatedly said how much she hated Frank and was ready to end his life. Because of this, one of her co-workers jokingly nicknamed her the Black Widow. At the same time, the man tried to keep calm and smooth over the rough edges. He repeatedly tried to talk to his former beloved, but she did not cease. The hero of the story even began documenting all conflicts. He did not want to cause her legal trouble, but he did it in case something bad happened. He just wanted to live and work in peace, but Maria clearly went too far. Escalation of the situation. By 2009, the Spencer's divorce process seemed endless. All this time, the children were with their mother. Frank tried not to despair and eventually met a woman named Julie Dent. Soon, the pursuer learned about her ex-husband's new relationship. According to her words, she didn't care that Frank was dating Julie. What bothered her most was that the rival had found a connection with the children. However, the man thought otherwise. He knew that the cause of all the troubles was his ex-wife's intense jealousy. After this event, Maria became completely enraged. In February 2009, she sent a voice message to Julie, warning her not to come near her children. However, the situation truly escalated when the main character's father-in-law was released from prison. After five years of incarceration for fraud, the criminal's reputation had only worsened. For Frank, this meant more trouble since he knew the fierce temperament of his former relative well. Many believed that Maria had inherited her character from her father. At this time, Spencer's circle noted that he had become pensive and worried, and not without reason, the first crime. After Rocco's release, a robbery occurred at Frank's office. Important documents that could have influenced the divorce proceedings were stolen. The next day, Maria called her ex-husband and mentioned that she found a trash bag with interesting contents on her porch. Frank understood what she was referring to and advised her to return what was taken. Additionally, he reported the break-in to the police. However, proving anyone's involvement in the incident was unsuccessful. According to detectives, no traces of the perpetrators were found. Nevertheless, everyone understood Maria and her father's interest in committing the crime. The investigation also considered the ex-wife as a suspect. Ultimately, the case investigation was discontinued. At the same time, thanks to the efforts of law enforcement, Maria handed over the acquired documents to the owner. Most likely, they simply contained nothing substantial that could be used in court. Thus, the lack of evidence was perceived by Spencer's pursuers as a license for impunity. The situation continued to escalate. The limit of patience. Subsequently, Threats from the former beloved followed on social media. She was still discontent that the children were communicating with Julie. Unlike her, the new partner was calm and balanced. She enjoyed spending time with her beloved and his kids. She tried not to interfere in the complicated relationships of the former spouses. However, she was extremely outraged that in her quest for revenge, Maria forgot about her parental responsibilities. The disputes continued until 2010. At that time, Frank's patience reached its breaking point. The man could not stand it any longer and turned to law enforcement. He asked the police officers to assess the behavior of his ex-wife and provided their correspondence. It clearly contained veiled threats. However, Maria claimed that this was just her way of communicating 
and that she meant nothing reprehensible by it. Once again, it was not possible to prove the woman's guilt since her warnings sounded vague. Unfortunately, this time too, the pursuer remained unpunished. Fires. In January 2010, another misfortune awaited the man. The couple planned to go on a romantic trip to the Caribbean islands. By strange coincidence, on the night before the trip, a fire broke out at Frank's mother's house. Fortunately, no one was harmed. However, all property was destroyed by fire and smoke. Witnesses claimed that a car, driven by Maria and accompanied by neighbors and acquaintances, pulled up to the house. The woman behind the wheel watched the scene with a smile before driving away. After the fire service extinguished the flames, a dog belonging to one of Frank's children was found among the ashes. Tragically, it did not survive that fateful night. Spencer was forced to call the police again. No one believed the fire was an accident. This time, Maria's actions had gone too far. It was clear she would stop at nothing to achieve her goals. Nevertheless, no evidence of deliberate arson was found as it likely was destroyed by the fire. Thus, the fire was deemed an accident. After this, the frenzied woman sent Frank a message in which she subtly gloated, writing about how karma had caught up with him, and for her ruined life, he might face yet more repercussions. Later, the pursuer began sending similar messages to Julie. With the police's inaction, Maria's audacity grew. She became so emboldened that she could afford public threats against her ex and his new partner. A few months later, a fire occurred at Julie's house. This time, the situation could have been much worse. She was home when the fire started. She managed to escape by jumping off the porch roof. Miraculously, she was unharmed, which could not be said for her home. It was not completely destroyed, but was rendered uninhabitable. Consequently, Frank invited his beloved to move in with him. Naturally, the young couple feared this would only anger his ex further, but they had no other options. At the same time, the cause of the fire was being investigated. The similar modus operandi made it clear whose handiwork it was. Since the woman's home was in a different county, the couple hoped for an impartial police investigation. However, even this time, they were of no help. Due to the lack of evidence, the fire could again be dismissed as a bizarre accident. Nevertheless, Julie was determined and appealed to higher authorities. This moved the investigation forward. Unexpectedly, flares were found in the applicant's backyard. One was damaged and lay nearby in the grass. Detectives also found another similar one, which apparently had caused the fire. Additionally, experts determined that the steps on the home's terrace had been doused with a flammable mixture. Eventually, after all inspections and expertise, arson was recognized as the cause of the fire. However, as before, no perpetrator was identified. Due to the lack of direct evidence, the potential criminals again evaded punishment. A Cold Summer, 2012 In June 2012, Frank and Julie decided to break up. In reality, it was a cunning plan to briefly lull Maria's vigilance. Then followed the final breakup of the Spencers. Unfortunately, the long-awaited peace did not come. Just a few weeks later, Frank was found deceased. On July 3rd, Joe, a friend of the main character, decided to visit his friend. There had been no word from him lately, which surprised no one. The man had recently gone through a divorce and wanted some solitude. However, there was urgent business. The friends had spent many years carting with their children. Their team was in the midst of a big series they hoped to win, but unexpected breakdowns could ruin the desired result. Since Frank was not responding to phone calls, Joe decided to visit him personally. Arriving at the cottage, the man grew anxious. The front door was slightly ajar, and there were stains near the threshold. His fears were confirmed as soon as he entered the house. His friend lay on the floor, lifeless. Frank's face was so serene it seemed as though he had finally found the peace he desired. The man circled the body and noticed dried blood in the ear. Without hesitation, the accidental witness called emergency services. When the news of the incident spread around the district, everyone knew who was behind such a monstrous crime. Nevertheless, 
It was up to the detectives to sort everything out on their own. Investigation. Experts who arrived at the scene found large pools of blood and several extensive drag marks. Additionally, a clear shoe print was discovered on the floor, and bloodied gloves were found in the kitchen. These physical pieces of evidence were sent for analysis. Subsequent investigation revealed that the bloody shoe print matched the model and size worn by Rocco, Maria's father. Furthermore, skin particles from Frank's ex-wife were found inside the examined gloves. It was known that the woman had not lived with the deceased for over a year, so the gloves with fresh DNA could not have been left in the house by chance. All evidence pointed to the involvement of both in the crime committed. Soon, the suspects were detained. Autopsy and ballistics analysis determined that Frank Spencer had been shot with two different types of weapons. The first bullet was fired from a .30 caliber sniper rifle as he stood by the front door. Forensic experts found a sniper's nest approximately 115 feet from the house. The bullet passed through his hand and penetrated his chest, striking a vital artery. The shot was fatal. However, the attackers did not stop there. They dragged the poor man inside, where a final controlling shot was fired into his head with a 357 Magnum revolver. By that time, the man was already deceased. Therefore, the final shot was seen as an act of revenge. It was clear that the shooter harbored hatred toward his victim. Consequently, police speculated that Rocco fired from the rifle while Maria finished what was started. Additionally, it was discovered that alongside the crime, Frank's car and dog were missing from the house, exposing Rocco and Maria. By reviewing traffic cameras, Spencer's car was spotted on a federal highway, moving away from the victim's house shortly after the crime. Unfortunately, it was not possible to identify the driver. Eventually, the vehicle was found in Sunbury, Pennsylvania, 27 miles from Frank's home and 5 miles from Maria's residence. However, no fingerprints or other evidence were discovered inside the car. Regarding the victim's dog, it was found two days after the incident, having wandered into a wedding in Dauphin. Attendees immediately realized that the well-groomed Weimaraner had an owner. Thanks to a microchip, the dog was returned to Spencer's mother. It turned out that Frank had gotten a new pet for his children after the fire. This fortunate discovery helped clarify some aspects and effectively expose the crime. According to the investigation, the criminals took the dog when they fled the scene. On their way home, Rocco stopped, and during this time, attracted by nearby food smells, the dog managed to escape. Subsequently, it ended up at a house where a wedding ceremony was taking place. This allowed detectives to prove that Rocco's phone pinged near the celebration site on the day of the crime. While his residence in Harrisburg was 12 miles away, contradicting his assertion that he was at home. Likely it was Maria's idea to take the dog to the children, but this decision proved to be a mistake. During questioning, Rocco admitted that his son-in-law had repeatedly asked him for help and had visited him the day before his death which explains the traces found at the crime scene. However, Rocco could not explain the presence of a blood pool. His statement sounded insincere, and no one could confirm whether the men got along well or otherwise. Rocco also confessed that Frank had given him the vehicle to use that same day, apparently to justify his fingerprints in the victim's home. By doing so, he essentially admitted to being at the crime scene the day before. Searches were organized at the homes of Rocco and his daughter to find the crime weapons, but the seasoned criminal knew how to dispose of firearms, so neither the rifle nor the revolver was found. Ultimately, it would not have been difficult for him to dispose of the crime weapon. Maria also refused to admit her guilt. She insisted that the glove ended up in her ex's house by accident, possibly moved by the children on one of the days. In the end, the suspects were released home. However, detectives did not close the case and continued to gather necessary evidence. Meanwhile, Frank's friend, Derek Reed, managed to talk to the former friend during a school football match. During their conversation, Maria confessed that the last thing her husband saw before his death was her face. Her statement sounded odd. 
the investigation received heightened attention from the state's attorney general, who was extremely upset with the authorities' indifference to Frank's reports and statements. Moreover, the police received numerous complaints about their incompetence. An internal investigation was unavoidable. Unfortunately, it was not possible to prove the officers' negligent attitude towards their duty. According to the police, much information provided by Spencer lacked solid evidence, and the only person who could confirm or refute the officers' words was deceased. The public and the victim's relatives were extremely outraged that their petitions yielded no results. Meanwhile, investigators tried to prove the suspect's guilt not only in the crime, but also in stalking and other offenses committed earlier. In 2013, a major interrogation was organized. At the same time, Maria and Rocco continued to claim their innocence, denying all 12 charges against them. Their unwillingness to cooperate with the investigation led to accusations of providing false testimony. Prosecutors believed that the suspects arrived at Spencer's house together. They chose not to use their own transport to avoid drawing attention, thus they fled the scene in the victim's car. In late 2014, Maria was arrested again. By this time, Rocco had managed to flee. After the last interrogation, he boarded a plane and flew to Colombia. The investigation interpreted the man's behavior as flight and proof of guilt. For 11 months, the criminal was elusive. Eventually, he was apprehended in Buenos Aires, Argentina, after being arrested by local police and fighting extradition to the U.S., however. The criminal's efforts were in vain, and he was sent back to his home country. Justice. In the fall of 2015, Maria's trial took place. She continued to deny her guilt and shifted the blame to her father. The accused claimed she loved Frank and never wished for his demise. However, numerous witnesses exposed her true character, recounting long-term threats, stalking, and arson. The trial lasted just over a week. In the end, the jury delivered their verdict. They found her guilty on all counts, including deprivation of life, arson, burglary, providing false statements, conspiracy, and making threats. Mrs. Spencer was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole plus an additional 50 years. Eyewitnesses claimed that Maria smiled constantly during the trial. I didn't end his life, so I tried to stay optimistic she explained in a later interview. A few years later, trials began for Rocco. He was extremely displeased with his daughter's accusations. The defendant insisted he was merely helping her but was against violence. It was Maria who insisted on the crime. However, physical evidence suggested otherwise. Finally, in the fall of 2018, Anthony Franklin was found guilty of deprivation of life, as well as robbery and arson. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, plus an additional 45 years. Upon sentencing, the 77-year-old man blew a kiss to the prosecutor and the lead detective before cursing the judge. Years later, Rocco sought a retrial, claiming his defense attorney had been ineffective, which led to his conviction. Maria also attempted to appeal her case. However, both father and daughter's efforts were fruitless. Every divorce comes with negative consequences. For some, it manifests in financial difficulties and emotional turmoil, leading to changes in social status and lifestyle. Over time, things typically settle into place. For Frank Spencer, however, such a breakup proved fatal. It must be said that the relationship he was in was horrendous. The man had harbored a serpent at his bosom and signed his own death warrant.